Here's the point in Galatians 5. In the teaching of Paul, as of Jesus, the Spirit is the one who gives life. After the return of the incarnate Christ to glory, it's the Spirit who gives life. How does he do that? He does it at conversion. He convinces an individual of sin and righteousness and the judgment that is to come, which leads people to seek the Lord. He, he doesn't convince of the philosophical emptiness of atheism, or the importance of believing in creationism. Oh, I'm sure he does. But those are not the primary things. He convinces of sin, and of righteousness, and of the judgment that's coming, and brings people to life. And he gives that gift of faith, and regenerates that person as they trust in Christ so that they are born again. He does it at the beginning. The Spirit gives life to start with. And then he does it all the way along the Christian life. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes amongst us and stands in our midst. He is the presence of Jesus in our daily experience. Jesus, who is the way we walk as his disciples, the, the, the truth we believe as his faithful ones, the, the life we live as his people, the Spirit mediates his presence to us. He is the one who has come that we as followers might have life and have it to the max. And the Spirit now does that job for Jesus, because Jesus' body has gone back to glory. Is that making sense? Do you want coffee? <laughs> Done that. What's the matter? Do you see this makes sense? He is the one who is working to bring us to life and to give us life as we live the life that God intends by grace, through faith alone, leaning on Him. So since we live by the Spirit, sign follows us. Since we live by the Spirit at work in and through us, mediating the presence of the risen, ascended Lord Jesus, Something follows. There's the proposition. We live by the Spirit, Galatians 5.25. Here's the exhortation. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. The second part of that verse. <coughs> now you need me to point out there's an ambiguity in the Greek word used here, in the Greek New Testament, between in and by. We live in Him, we live by Him. Since we live in Him, since we live by Him, the Spirit giving us life, Spirit, the God in whom we live. Okay, given that he's all of that to us, how shall we spend our time? Well, you believe Christianity is about how I spend my time? Is it? Well, I've changed the way I spend my time now. Are you sure about that? Yeah. How are you going to spend your time differently if now you're living your life with God with you? Some of us live our lives differently if our wife or our husband's with us, or if our child or our whatever is a parent, that's the one, is with us. Right? How are you going to live differently? How are you going to spend your time differently if God's always there with you? Is that, is that a real relevant question? Of course it affects the way you spend your time. How are you going to spend your time? If God, the, the Spirit, is with you, well, you're going to keep in step, says Paul. Are you going to spend your time now trying to keep in step with him? Or are you going to try and spend your time treading on his toes? Pretty obvious. You better understand a bit about what Paul is saying here when, when you realise that there's, there's a Greek word for walk in Galatians 5.16. Somebody read Galatians 5.16 for us. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Yeah, it's great having the NIV because it interprets these little differences away for us and then we don't notice. It says live by the Spirit. Actually, the, the verb is peripateo, right? It means to walk. To walk. You know, legs, feet, walking, like that. So I say, live by the Spirit. Walk with the Spirit. The way the disciples walked around Galilee with Jesus, listening to Him, learning from Him, talking to Him. In his presence, being formed by him. The difference between that word in verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you want to fulfill the desire of the sinful nature, with this one here, this word here in verse 25, somebody got verse 25 for me. Since we live by the Spirit, and let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now again, the NIV helps us because it says keep in step. It's a different word for walking. Stoiketo means to walk in line with, or to be in line with. Paul is here saying, keep in step with the Spirit. The, the Spirit has given you life. Now let Him direct your steps. 
And that verb stoikeo means to be in line with, to stand beside a person or a thing, to hold, to agree, to follow. And it's the habitual practice in the way the grammar works out. Here's how it looks. I thought I'd do a bit of Greek on the screen for you because I'm looking in colour. And it makes a point. See the point? The, gr the red bits are the if-then statement. If that, then this. Does that make sense? So the red bits are the if-then statement. And then the green bits on the end live and walk. Yeah? And then pneumati, the spirits in the middle. Since live by the spirit do we, by the spirit, even, let us keep in step. That's how it works out. It's all about the spirit. We live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. Now there's, there's no doubt in Paul's voice, he is accepting their Christians and this therefore follows for them. Keeping in step. Bit of background. In ancient history, the most powerful, the most efficient, the most developed empires developed ways of moving organized units of troops from one place to another on the battlefield without getting individuals mixed up with other units. Otherwise, as masses of people maneuvered amongst each other, individuals get lost, end up having to attach themselves to any old unit. And some of the ways it was tried to be done by the Greek city-states that have a system of flags so people could identify their own units and their side on the field and, and make their way to their correct flag bearer if they got separated. But the best way to do it was by sticking to formed up squads, forming a box of men who moved as a single body, because then you had weight that you could deploy in battle. Tactically, it was a good thing. Do you see the point? Who is Paul writing to? in this letter? It's not a trick question, honest it's not. Galatians were what? A bunch of... Celts. Thank you for that! A bunch of Celts! And you've all seen the film, haven't you? Celts. And you've seen how they fight in battle. It's every man for himself, isn't it? If you've seen the film, you, you know. It's every man for himself. The way Celts did battle was... You know, world and stuff, right? Spear in your handles. Pitchfork or something, I don't know. And they were coming up against organised discipline. An axe and a sword. Pardon? It's usually an axe and a sword. An axe and a sword, thank you, Caleb. They do a lot about cats in Caleb's school. It's quite impressive. But they're coming up against well formed, solid ranks of people with. And, you know, and they march together as an army. Yeah. It's called a crab. So Paul is saying to those guys, you've seen the way the Romans work, because the Roman Empire has now overrun you. You've seen how they work and how they fight and how they do battle. Hey, you better be doing battle like that. You better be standing together and keeping in step with the Spirit of God. Making sense? See the, how the context plays together? Overall, that meant command systems were affected. Men stayed together. They could be commanded as units. And Josephus, first century Jewish historian, he testifies to the superiority of Roman discipline, Roman battle plans, part of the discipline and ordered method of moving formed up squads from one place to the other. You've got to keep in step. And that discipline not only enables tactical man management, it gives you a, a superior fighting army. Now I read all sorts of things for you in the preparation of these sermons, you know that? I read all sorts of tosh and I also read some interesting things. And, and on this occasion I've actually gone to the military drill book. You know how big the military drill book is? It's huge. Huge thing. Very bulky book. And in the preamble to the military drill book, it says, It is confidently asserted that the foundation of discipline in battle is based on drill. And this has been proven again and again. Apparently, Robert Graves, the war poet, said, There are three types of troops those with guts who could not drill, those good at drill but with no guts, and those who had guts and could drill well. And these last fall the best of all. It would seem to be really important. So what happens then? Back to my days in school. Back to my days with the combined cadet force, can you imagine? What a fine band of brothers not. In military practice, a squad forms up on the square. They form up to march, they space themselves out, and when they've done that, they've got particular people to keep an eye on. Did you realise that? The way we were taught it was, you know, you're going to march in line, you're going to march in time, and you keep in line by keeping an eye on the person to your left. He's the marker. And at the end of each rank, as you're formed up, the guy on the left is the marker for that rank. And the guy who's really important is the guy at the front, on the left-hand side, 
everybody ends up watching him eventually. You keep your eye on that guy. That's the way we were taught it. Crucial people. Watch into your front. Keep it in step. Keep it in line with the man in front. But the absolutely crucial man is at the left hand end of the front rank. Because he's only got his own wit and cunning, maybe just maybe, a drill sergeant in front of him, maybe a CSM, to take his step from. And the point is, this, this little black battle group, this platoon or whatever it is, is going to stick together and move together maintaining unity and maintaining command and maintaining operational effectiveness. Each member of that unit needs to be watching and working to keep in step with the marker. And the marker for the people of God is the Spirit of God. Keep in step with the Spirit. Does that make sense? So the point of drill, keeping in step, keeping in line, was to be able to give cohesion to large groups of people. This splitting up and scattering in Galatia because of this distracting teaching. To be able to move together and to discipline action. Now you're all bored to death of that, so let's give you a quick little video parable and then you'll see what we mean. Ready? step with the Spirit. Rather than being distracted by all the other things that go around, that seem, they seem good enough in themselves, but they're not the fundamental task for the people of God. Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit. How do you do that? Very quickly. Look and listen. Two hours. Look and listen. If you're going to keep in step with the one who functions as your company sergeant major, you're going to have to keep your eyes pretty fixed on that marker on the left hand side. And you're going to have to keep your ears pretty much attentive to what he's saying. Isn't that right? It's not complicated. How on earth does that work out in life? Well, you know, if you're not listening for the word of command, in that sort of setting, when people are marching and moving, you're worse than useless. You're a liability. And you're useless in God's church and the armies of the Lord, if you like, if you're not listening out daily to his word. Because what he will do is that you will cause all sorts of chaos. 
If you're not listening out for the word of command, and I've seen this happen, I've seen this happen more than once with lads marching up and down the square. Somebody doesn't listen to the word of command, but gets their left and their right wrong or whatever, and what you end up with is called a pile-up. Can you imagine? It's really funny. But it's not funny in the church of God. It's not funny when it happens here. So we listen out for where he speaks, and where he speaks most clearly is in his word. You listen to his word. More than that, you hear your brethren's ministry to you. We don't just have a cup of tea afterwards for a lark. This is where we share our lives together and we learn from one another. Paul talks about in Colossians 3 16 about um, letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. There's an edification, there's a listening to the voice of God going on in fellowship. When he speaks, when it's quiet to your heart. How important it is to take those times when you can actually just stop. You've just got to do this. You're not too busy to do this. Stop and actually listen to what's being said. Elijah was in that position, wasn't he? When did Elijah hear the voice of God? It was when he had that time quiet and heard the still, small voice of calm. Looking as well as listening. Seeing what he's doing and throwing your weight in there. Seeing where he's active, where he's at work, where he's changing people's lives. When he works in the world that's all around you, you see what he's doing. And you jump in there. So keeping together, marching to command is an important matter for the kingdom of God. Have you said about doing it? Look and listen for the Spirit of God. So if the heart of the Christian gospel is that the works of the law that depend on human strength are useless to save you and useless to change you, but that we need to be saved by the sacrifice of Christ to put right with God by grace through faith alone and live by those same principles daily, then the essence of the Christian life becomes this, to keep in step with that spirit. That's the essence of the Christian life. Now he's by no means going to take us away from the word that he's inspired, but he will keep us marching in step as we look to and listen to him. And that's where the operational power of the Roman army sprang from. And that's where the operational power of the Church of God springs from to this day. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Thanks for your